On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger soared into the sky for a mere 73 seconds before meeting a fiery end. Here's a minute-by-minute -minute breakdown of what occurred. Before the Challenger disaster, most people viewed the Space Shuttle much like an airplane, reusable, dependable, comfortable, and safe. I believe it'll be thrilling for children to turn on their TVs and witness space travel becoming accessible to all. However, there was a critical flaw in risk assessment. A three-part study initially released in 1979 calculated that the odds of a shuttle disintegrating during a launch, exactly as Challenger did, were between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 10,000. The most vulnerable component? The solid fuel rocket boosters. By 1983, another study indicated the risk of a shuttle breakup was nearer to 1 in 100. Following the tragedy, physicist Richard P. Feynman noted, the higher estimates, like 1 in 100, come from engineers, while the far lower ones, 1 in 100,000, come from management. The Challenger disaster led to the creation of a new program to gather data, including flight and test records, for risk analysis, something NASA hadn't considered necessary before. This oversight helps explain how such glaring mistakes were made. Preparations for Challenger's launch spanned months, starting in 1984 and involving 37 weeks of crew training. The disaster's date wasn't even the original launch target. After a flight readiness review on January 15th, launch schedules shifted repeatedly to accommodate aborted landing scenarios and optimal viewing of Halley's Comet, a key objective, alongside deploying the Spartan satellites. The mission faced repeated delays, with NASA finally settling on January 22, 1986. Complications mounted as further setbacks arose in the days leading to launch. That January was unusually cold, and with temperatures plunging far below freezing, Challenger was set to launch under conditions no shuttle had ever faced. Despite awareness of potential catastrophe, NASA aimed to increase launch frequency. Liftoff was postponed from the 26th to the 27th due to weather, and on the 27th, Challenger nearly left the pad. The crew was prepared on the morning of January 27th, and NASA records show everything proceeding as planned. Shuttle operations began at 12.30 a.m. The crew awoke at 5.07 a.m. and was secured in their seats by 7.56 a.m. Roughly an hour later, they notified control of a door jar signal, an issue with the exterior hatch. Once ground crews fixed the door, they couldn't remove the exterior handle the screws securing it were stuck. For two hours, ground crew wrestled to detach the hatch handle using screwdrivers, a drill, and a hacksaw. By the time they finally succeeded, the crew had been waiting for five hours, and the launch window had closed. I remember thinking, wow, this feels more like a Three Stooges rerun than a space shuttle launch. Kennedy Shuttle Chief Bob Seek released a statement it just wasn't our day. Our plan is to reset and aim for Tuesday morning. The Challenger disaster nearly didn't occur, and if Morton Theocol's engineers had their way, it wouldn't have. Morton Theocol manufactured the O-rings, later deemed responsible for the tragedy. On January 27th, around 1 p.m., NASA contacted Theocol to ask if the cold weather might pose risks. Management deliberated internally, consulted engineers by 2.30 p.m., and by 5.45 p.m., they advised NASA to postpone the launch. After further debate, another meeting was scheduled for 8.45 p.m. Engineer Roger Bougelet stressed that the O-rings weren't designed for Florida's freezing temperatures. Not a single person in that room supported launching, he noted, Put simply, the O-ring is a rubber seal containing hot gases during solid fuel launches. When too cold, the rubber loses flexibility, risking leaks and catastrophe if improperly seated. Based on engineer input, Theocol had declared launches unsafe below 53 degrees Fahrenheit, the lowest temperature previously tested.
That position held until 10.30 p.m. Stalled arguments over temperature risks led Theocol and NASA to pause discussions and reconvene later. When they did, their revised recommendations would seal Challenger's fate. The teleconference resumed at 11 p.m. Bougelet later reflected, It's baffling how NASA and Marshall deemed Challenger flight ready unless they assumed failure had to be proven. Otherwise, success was guaranteed. In short, without definitive proof of O-ring failure, Theocall deemed them safe. Miss your schedule, miss your budget. I pushed myself. It was a pride thing. One admitted. Theocall executives faxed their signed launch approval at 11.45 p.m., despite lingering NASA objections. Overnight temperatures had again plunged below freezing, and at 1.35 a.m., crews were sent to the launch site to assess potential ice hazards. Simultaneously, issues with the ground liquid hydrogen storage tank delayed fueling. By 3 a.m., inspection teams submitted their report, and the countdown proceeded. The delay, however, caused a ripple effect. The crew's wake-up call was set for 6.18 a.m., but reports suggest they were already awake as mission debates dragged on. As early as 5 a.m., O-ring concerns resurfaced, yet by the 9 a.m. meeting reviewing a second launch site inspection, the topic went unmentioned. That inspection began at 7 a.m. with ice and cold remaining top concerns, yet the launch stayed on schedule. A lot of people had this gut feeling that something just didn't feel right, one recalled. The delay gave the Challenger crew extra prep time. NASA logs note they lingered over breakfast but a grim footnote hides in the records. Neither then nor in earlier weather discussions was the crew told of concerns about low temperatures effects on the shuttle system. How could they live with themselves after a decision like that? Media, including CBS Radio's Frank Motek, documented the scene. A year later, Motek remembered watching the crew. We saw them gather for breakfast, travel to the pad, suit up, and bored. We caught Krista McAuliffe's smile as a technician handed her an apple. They reached the pad at 8.03 a.m. By 8.36, they were strapped in. Eight minutes later, another ice inspection forced yet another delay. The final ice check concluded at 11.15 a.m. Then it was go time. Liftoff began at 11.38 a.m. at T-6.6 .6 seconds, the engines fired. At zero, the boosters ignited. Seven seconds later, Challenger's flight deck called out a roll program. Houston acknowledged. At 65 seconds, Houston relayed another instruction. Then, 73 seconds after ignition, signal vanished. NASA insists all was nominal, no alarms, no warnings, until suddenly, there was nothing. Below, roughly 500 spectators, including neighbors of pilot Michael J. Smith and friends of Krista McAuliffe, witnessed events unfold in a flash. By the time liftoff's roar reached them, fiery streaks already split the sky. Chillingly, NASA confirmed their first awareness of catastrophe aligned with the horror etched into students watching via satellite the moment the shuttle fractured. Flight, do you see? We've had negative contact. We lost the link. Challenger launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, under Houston's mission control supervision, while the mission catastrophically failed in just 73 seconds. The New York Times reported that in the immediate aftermath, controllers continued insisting all was normal. In fact, 105 seconds post-launch, Public Affairs Officer Stephen A. Nesbitt still claimed radar track Challenger, though it didn't. Flight controllers, you're looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously, a major malfunction. By July, NASA released evidence hinting the crew briefly knew something was wrong. Three emergency packs had activated, and the final cockpit recording captured pilot Michael J. Smith uttering, Uh-oh! At the 73-second mark, NASA was forever altered, 
Immediately, experts scrambled to pinpoint blame. Among them was physicist Richard Feynman, Manhattan Project veteran, Nobel laureate, who reluctantly joined the investigation. I personally doubt they're touching the face of God, he said. I prefer to respect them by finding why they died, not standing around looking sad. Promised full cooperation, Feynman later called the process, sitting around doing nothing most of the time. So he bypassed NASA management, interviewing engineers directly before being barred. He'd already uncovered the O-ring dispute and later stunned the Rogers Commission hearings twice. First, by dunking an O-ring in ice water to prove its fatal rigidity. No resilience at 32 degrees. And second, when Morton Theocol's Alan McDonald contradicted NASA's denials by stating, Mr. Chairman, we recommended not to launch. By April 1986, NASA declared recovery operations complete. Most wreckage and all seven astronauts' remains were retrieved 17 miles off Florida's coast. Forensic work would conclude in accordance with family desires. The crew compartment was intact but crushed beneath eight-foot-tall debris. Descriptions were grim. Little more than rubble? Unrecognizable as human? Yet not all pieces were found. In 1996, Cocoa Beach washed up two wing flap sections, one eight by 14 feet, requiring heavy machinery to move. Then, in 2022, divers filming a History Channel special on the Bermuda Triangle discovered a 20-foot Challenger segment. NASA acknowledged the find. This discovery lets us pause to uplift the legacies of the seven pioneers and reflect on how this tragedy changed us.